As you know, we are in the series talking about how we can live to our fullest. And so we've been exploring the way that God has shaped our lives, uh, looking at our spiritual gifts. And last week we looked at our heart or a passion that God has given to us. Today we're going to be exploring our abilities, talents, and skills. And knowing that as we look to the future, personality and experience are coming. So we get the whole package. It'll be a lot of fun. But the idea is that as we look at our shape, we're able to understand a little bit about how it is that God has designed us. And if we understand some of that, we can start to imagine and dream for where is God calling us? What is it that God's um, wanting us to live for our greatest purpose uh, for God's kingdom? And so as we think about our talents, abilities, and skills, we chose this passage from Exodus, not just so we can hear if Sally could do it, but she did a great job. Uh, but because it is one of the examples that we have in the scripture where it identifies individuals for their various abilities and skills. And what's great about this story is we know that uh, what has happened about this story, God had called Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the desert. And they were there for you know 40 years is the total time. But in the time that they were there in the desert, there was a lot of stuff going on. There, of course, was you know had making food and having families and, and enjoying life or trying to figure out how to not grumble too much in the desert. Um, and they also God was present with them. God led them out with his presence. In front of them was this pillar of fire, and behind them was this pillar of smoke, a way of protecting them as they walked through this holy land or the desert together. And Moses, of course, would meet with God. Uh, and I've shared before one of my favorite passages is how Moses would go to a tent outside of the camp, and he would meet with God and says, Moses and God would talk like friends. And I just think that's such a beautiful idea that we can talk to God as friends. But God instructed Moses that isn't just in this place that he is going to meet with them and that not just the pillars of fire and smoke, but that God's presence would abide or live with the people. And the way that that was going to happen was through this holy place called the tabernacle, basically a nice big tent. But it had to be designed correctly, had to be designed perfectly so that God's presence, his spirit would be able to be there amongst the people. And to make sure that it was designed the right way, God gave them the instructions, the floor plan, if you will, the blueprints for this beautiful tent. And what's amazing about that is when we see pictures of a tent in the desert, we often think of this really sort of bland gray tent <laughs> with, uh, you know, basically overcoming some dirt. And that's where Jesus, where God would meet with the people. But when we hear the descriptions, we hear descriptions about ornate gold and silver and instruments of metal. We hear about woodworking. We hear about the embroidery of the priests and all who were there. And so when we think about this list of skills that God gave to Beziel and Aholiab, thank you, Sarah, uh, sorry, Sally, uh, there's a beautiful piece. Uh, all of these things together, all of these talents are needed. You know, and it's interesting because we think about the priests, they had this uh, breastplate that had but the stones that were laid into this breastplate, one stone for each of the tribes of Israel, and those were precious stones. They had uh, garments that were had to be hemmed, and on the bottom of those hems, there was all kinds of uh, pageantry and uh, pictures of things that were there, one of them being a pomegranate. I'm not sure why I think that's important, but you know that, that had to be embroidered there on the bottom of the hem of the garment. So when we think about all of the artistry that had to happen, we see that God had plans for people to be able to use their talents, their skills. I, I imagine that some people might say, well, no, I know I've got certain skills, but I'm not sure if I'm going to use them. But in this story, we see that God used lots of different skills in order for this tabernacle to come about. Often in life, we do sort of dismiss our talents. I know that uh, in talking with various people, they've put away some of the talents, things they might be good at, but they put it away because it's not going to make them enough money. I wonder if you've ever been in that boat. I know that talking with a lot of students who are looking at college options are saying, well, I might be good at pottery, but it's not going to earn me an income. I can understand that. There's some, some concerns. Or I'm, I'm good at doing embroidery, but you know, it's not a very popular art, you know, talent at the moment. And so they put that away. The truth is that God has given each of us talents and abilities and resources to, to do God's work. And when we dismiss those talents, we might be missing out on something that God calls us to be about. You probably know this, but you are the only you who has ever been on this planet. And my wife says, thank God, there's only one of you, right? Maybe here's some echoes going on. What's going on there? But we realize that 
maybe that the whole of who you are, those talents, capabilities, skills, and abilities that God has planted in you are exactly what God wants to have displayed in this time, in this region, for this generation, because God wants the world to see what he has planted in you. And when we hide that, we put those skills, talents away, we miss out on seeing some of the beauty, the artistry, the creativity that God wants to see in the world. God has given you those abilities for a purpose, that God might use you for God's kingdom. I think of an interesting story of, uh, this is the founding of Habitat for Humanity, Millard and Linda Fuller. Uh, Millard Fuller uh, was a young entrepreneur. He uh, went to business school, uh, MBA, um, and said that, that was his life's objection, uh, objective. Sorry, He was going to earn as much money as he possibly can. And by the age of 29, he was a self-made millionaire. And uh, he and his wife were talking, and he said, you know, I know that I could probably earn lots more money. But he said, this feels very empty. Money for money's sake doesn't feel like it's worth anything. And so he and his wife began to pray about what it was that their life was going to be about. And so they decided to commit themselves to Christian service and became missionaries. Uh, they went down south to uh, around Georgia and Atlanta. There was a community called Koinonia. Uh, in Koinonia, they practice a kind of a sharing where there's not personal property, but they share together. They share meals together. They share uh, in ministry and community together. But one of the things they do is they serve in mission to their neighborhood. And one of the primary things that they were doing was helping to build homes with their neighbors, people who were having a hard time, you know, getting all the funding together to build their own house, who couldn't get it together. So they were helping their community with the housing crisis. You know, this is in 1970, so somehow they solved it in 1970. That's why we don't have a housing crisis today. Pause for comic relief, <laughs> right? But one of the things they recognized that if they started working with people who are willing to work, with the corporations and others who had the funding and others who had the talent and the skill that they might be able to put together homes for their community. And so began Habitat for Humanity. In order to try this out, they tried it in a few different places. They went to Zaire in Congo, and they spent some time there trying some projects to build homes, and it started to come together what the outline of that project would be. And so what was great about this is in 1976, uh, they launched Habitat for Humanity. And you know, you know, today, Habitat for Humanity is in every of the 50 states. It's in 60 countries around the world. And over a million people have found homes through Habitat for Humanity. All because somebody said, you know, I wonder what I can do with the gifts that God has given me. He had gifts in entre being an entrepreneur, figuring out some new options, something that has never happened before, how we can make that model work. He had gifts in organizing people together, gifts in helping people see uh, what might be possible if they work together, visioning, leadership, and he was pretty good at a hammer. <laughs> he was pretty good at putting things together. Uh, a friend of mine from another congregation in California, he talks about having the uh, theology of the hammer. He never wants to be in front of the church at all, but he's there. He's the first person to sign up and help coordinate teams that go and build things. He helped our teams when we went down to Mississippi, when we were rebuilding homes after Katrina went through things. And I'm sure in a little while we'll be building homes <laughs> in North Carolina after the flooding there. But he says, you know, when, when I'm out there and I am building people's homes, I feel God smile. I feel God smile. Because he knows that he's using his talent and his ability, which is just, uh, you know, putting things together. He feels that that's what God's called him to be about, and he's excited about that. We'd never want to hear him preach, but we know that he is doing God's work. Now, for all of us, God has put his talents in us. And what do you know? That God doesn't waste talents. That your abilities are a strong indication of what God wants your life to be, what he wants you to be about. God matches our calling and our capabilities. Now, I say this because I, I recognize that so often we dismiss ourselves. This time in my life, I'm so busy, I just need to get things done, and my talents and my abilities, I can leave them in the closet somewhere. Until I get this done, I will get around to it, and eventually I will pull up my talents and skills. I've mentioned this before, but, you know, talents by themselves don't just grow. <laughs> they do require some passion, some experience, some ongoing development of what happens there. Certainly that those talents and abilities might stay dormant. They start to dissipate over a while. But we recognize that the best way to use them is to use them. Then they grow and we can multiply them. 
I think about that when we offer a little bit of ourselves, a little bit to God, God is able to multiply that. And sometimes it feels like we're giving it away. Jesus reminds us in this passage where he says, you know, unless a grain falls and dies, it remains just a single kernel. But when it goes to the ground and dies, it creates a harvest, right? The same thing with our talents. We might not have any idea of where that will grow, how that will look. But when we offer to God and start to follow those passions that God has called us to be about, those people that we're called to serve, we recognize it comes together and we then begin to see God's kingdom flow in and through us in a variety of ways. So on the handout that I made sure that you have, this is actually just a copy of the summary sheet that um, <clears throat> I passed out when we first started this series. And I would invite you to consider love it, like it, or leave it. <clears throat> now on that sheet, you'll see this nice long list of things that could be in your talent pool, right? And this is not an exhaustive list, right? There's probably compendiums of lists of abilities and skills. But I invite you to look over that list. And if it's something that you love, I would invite you to circle it, right? Big circle. I like to do, and I love to do that. Now, what that means is that's something that you would do every day, even if you never got paid to do it, <laughs> because you just love doing it. When you do it, people are excited, people enjoy it. Uh, you enjoy it, you get thrilled by getting a chance to do that. That's something you love, right? A few of those that you're going to circle. If it's something you like, I'm going to invite you to underline it. It's, you know, liking it means that, yeah, you're pretty good at it, it's okay. But if you didn't have to do it again, it wouldn't bother you too much, right? It's just something you like, right? Lastly is you leave it. Something that you really don't like doing. Something that if you were asked to do it, you would rather be paid a million dollars instead, right? There's just this whole thing you would hate to, you'd have to pay a million dollars to avoid doing. You don't want to do that at all. And there, I don't want you to do anything. Just leave it. That's what the name implies, just leave it. And so as you're looking at this list, you know, think about things that you love doing. Do you love doing art? And art happens in so many different ways, right? It's not just about being good with a pencil and drawing something, not just good with a paintbrush. Music, uh, we're talking about being good with um, pottery, with glass, with any sort of putting things together, working with materials in order to communicate something to the larger world. This can be an artistic talent in different ways. Uh, think about finances or mathematics. Sometimes we say, well, it's just, a, it's just something I'm good at. Yeah, it's something you're good at. Pay attention to that. Um, and if you love doing it, that's a great skill. Um, the thing about music, of course, music abilities that happen in so many different ways. Voice, piano, it's always nice to see Bev sharing her talents with us. Uh, and as a congregation, so many talents. Uh, it's not just the people up front, but all of us have talents. I think one of the things I'm excited about with Dinner Church is the open invitation. If you have something you want to bring, a song, a poem, a dance, uh, come and do that. Uh, you, have, you get an opportunity to share something of what God has given to you. So take a quick moment, looking over those things, circle some of those things that, are, that you really enjoy doing, that you would love. Um, <clears throat> I'll just describe a couple more as you're looking over that list. Uh, linguistics. The choir. Well, there we go. We might have a few sheets somewhere floating around. Hey, we've got a whole stack. The talent of seeing the needs of others and helping to provide for it. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, yeah, so with music, we've talked about that. Uh, linguistics. Some people are just enjoy learning new words in foreign cultures and experiencing that. That's part of a skill that you might have, a talent that you might do. So the whole point with this series, of course, is that at the end, you'll have had a chance to look at your spiritual gifts. You know, last week, we were talking about our hearts and our passions, and then we are looking at our abilities. And so my hope would be that as you are going through this list, that when we put the summary together, you'll be able to see your shape, all of those pieces, uh, because we will be asking you to put it together <laughs> at this. So uh, this isn't just, oh, that's a nice thought, David. Uh, but no, this is something for us to actually work on together. All right. I'll give you just a moment to think about those things. As you do, one thing I will share with you is that what makes the difference between simply doing an activity and it just feeling like an ordinary thing and something that is extraordinary is what happens in the context of who you're doing it for. That when we are, you know, for instance, if I cook, you know, for myself, eh, eh, that's not so interesting. But if I know I'm cooking for a group, for I know I'm going to be giving something to a group of people, a family or the church or, or people who are hungry, that's exciting, right? It brings a smile to my face. So the, the, even the same skill, if it's done for a particular group, 
can turn it from an ordinary to an extraordinary experience. And I wonder, as you're thinking about our last week, we were talking about our hearts, our passions, and you think about your talents. I think about the context in which you experience those talents. Uh, it, where, where is it that you are? Is it with a group of people? Is it by yourself? Is it uh, with others? Is it at a retreat center? Is it with children, adults, elderly? Whatever it might be like. Consider what that would look like. And maybe there's been experiences for you where uh, it, turned, it seemed like this was great talent in this place, but not in another place. I kind of worked that out. By the way, that's partly why I've been encouraging these small groups, the Suppers for Six. Because uh, when you share what you think your talents are, others have a chance to reflect back. Yeah, that is a talent. And maybe there was a time that you forgot and someone says, you know, when you did this, it was really neat. I really enjoyed when you did that. Uh, and then there might be things you're like, oh, I'm not good at this at all. And they're like, no, no, we see that. It's good to have other people to encourage you and respond to those needs uh, or those uh, insights into our lives. So as we think about these things, and I mentioned that we, we have an opportunity to offer these talents to God, we recognize that God can do even more than we even ask or imagine. Robert Browning put it this way, a person's reach should extend their grasp or exceed their grasp, or what's heaven for? The idea is that that little that we have, when we trust God with it, God can do infinitely more than we can imagine. So what would it look like if you were able to live into those abilities to your maximum potential? If you actually spent time focusing and allowing for that to grow to its greatest potential, what would that look like? What would that be? My, my hope as a hope, as a church, is that we are able to live into this excitement of what God calls us to be about. That there might be some new ministries, some new talents that are experienced together. That we would recognize that, it's, that we're, we don't have just a little bit, but that we're overflowing with abilities and talents and skills as a congregation and looking for opportunities and mission uh, in the world around us, in the community. What difference can we make in our community if we allowed for our gifts to come alive? as a congregation. My guess is the world would never be the same if, if we were actually to live that out and transform according to what God would call us to be about. So as you're imagining that, as you're dreaming that, I invite you to sketch that down too on that piece of paper that we printed out so that you can bring it together, the whole shape of what we're called to be. So God has given us talents, abilities, and skills. We've seen examples of that. We're hearing about our own talents and skills. And as we pray, I invite you to Turn those over to God. Say, Lord, what would you do with my life with these skills today? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your work in us. We thank you that as we recognize our lives, the talents that you've given to us, that we have talents that we've used and others that we have laid dormant. Today, as we come before you, help us to be aware of where it is you would want us to focus, to allow for you to work through us that we might see your work in these gifts and these talents. I pray that you would multiply those gifts within each of us, Lord, that as we pursue you, we would see your hand at work. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.